Thank you, baby. I appreciate it. Scott, thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Ziegler, for being here. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be with you tonight. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, ultimately ask you for your vote on June the 21st. We're very pleased with uh, the results on May the 24th. Uh, we've worked hard for the last year. I announced for Secretary of State on May the 7th of 2021. And we have traveled all over our great state and met so many wonderful people uh, and asked them for their vote and talked to them about the Secretary of State's role in elections, the Secretary of State's role in business administration and economic development and so many other things. My name is Wes Allen. I was born and raised in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, I was a walk-on football, football player for the University of Alabama for Coach Gene Stallings and Mike Dubos. I remember Ray Mellick as uh, the newspaper guy that covered there, uh, Birmingham Post Herald, right? Ray? I remember him, he covered the team. Uh, and uh, Dabo Sweeney was my position coach as a, as a walk-on wide receiver. I enjoyed my time there, but the best thing I got out of the University of Alabama was my wife. She was the head crimsonette for the Million Dollar Band, and uh, we met there on the campus of the University of Alabama. We'll be married 23 years this year, and we've got two children, Davis and Deanna, and uh, Davis is 20 and Deanna is 18. And uh, we worship at First Baptist Church of Troy, where I lead a small group of men in Sunday school about my age. And I'm an ordained deacon there in our church. And uh, so we, we went down to Troy and migrated south out of Tuscaloosa. And that's where we have planted, planted our flag uh, there and made Troy our home. We love Troy. And that's where I served as a probate judge for almost 10 years, right at 10 years. And currently serve in the Alabama House of Representatives for the last four years. Now I'm running for Secretary of State to take that experience from probate judge and the state legislature uh, to the Secretary of State's office. Thank you, and I want to first thank all of you for voting me the leading candidate for Secretary of State in the May 1st primary. Uh, we achieved 43% of the vote with the help of many people like you over the state. We've got to finish the job a week from tomorrow at 50% plus one vote. And I want to ask you to be that one vote if I can get to 50%. I first got interested and concerned about election irregularities, election problems in America in the 2000 presidential election. That was the famous Bush Gore challenge in the state of Florida. We had terrible problems. After that, the National Republican Party decided that they would put a team of election lawyers in Florida before each presidential election. And I was selected to go. And I went to Florida as part of the election integrity team in 2004, 2008, and 2012. And we worked beforehand to spot problem areas, potential problems, and then on election day, I served on the hotline as poll workers, Republican watchers, officials, citizens would call in reporting the problems. And I got a total immersion in what can go wrong and what needs to be fixed. That led to my interest in election contest, election integrity. Uh, I asked for your vote for Secretary of State a week from tomorrow. Thank you, Jim. So we'll start with questions, and I'll try to be as, as clear as I can when I'm speaking. Uh, Jim will have this question first, and Wes will have it second. Uh, neither one of these candidates have ever seen these questions. No one's got any heads up. And the, so these questions are a little different than, than what you usually hear. It now seems that everyone on the Republican ticket says the same thing when running for office. And then afterwards, voters are surprised by the person that they elected votes or action. In a nutshell, how would you describe your philosophy when it comes to the proper role of government? I'm convinced that one of the many reasons for the low turnout, we had 23% vote in the May primary. That means out of every four people that you see, three of them did not vote at all. One of the reasons is that Candidates, particularly Republican candidates, run on one set of 
a platform and they get in and, and it's almost like a different person. Well, if you look at the Jim Ziegler campaign for state auditor in 2014 and 2018, and then what I did in that office, it's not only identical, I went the second mile above and beyond what we talked about in the election. My philosophy is that candidates who are elected then become servant leaders and they are to serve the general public. Thank you, Ken. Wes? Proper role of government, number one, is to protect our constitutional rights. We see so many times, and we've seen it, and we're seeing it more and more, that our constitutional rights are under attack. We see it all the time. I'm so proud of my record in the Alabama House of Representatives uh, to vote to protect your constitutional rights. I'm the only one in this race that has stood in the well of that house, argued for protecting our constitutional rights, and voted to protect your constitutional rights. I voted for that constitutional carry bill to protect your right to defend yourself and to defend your home and to defend your families because it's important. We need to protect freedom of speech, not just freedom of speech, but freedom to exercise our religion, right? Because there's so many times they want the, the folks that want to take our constitutional rights away, they don't want us to go out and practice our faith in public. So we need men and women in government who will protect our constitutional rights first and foremost. All right, the second question is a little bit long. Many of you in the audience have probably heard about ERIC. It is the Electronic Registration Information Center. We began to hear it after the 2020 election. But let me read a statement first. The elect Electronic Registration Information Center, also known as ERIC, is a nonprofit organization with the sole mission of assisting states to improve the security and accuracy of America's voter rolls and increase access to voter registration for all eligible citizens. ERIC is governed and managed by states who choose to join and was formed in 2012 with the assistance from the Pew Charitable Trust. The question is, do you support the use of ERIC? If not, what will you use to maintain clean voter rolls that the current Secretary of State's office is not already using? Question to Wes first. Back in February, I was the, uh, the first person in this, as a candidate in this race, to say that on day one, if I'm elected as Secretary of State, that I will start the process of getting us out of Eric. Uh, I found many problems with Eric. I have a problem with Eric. Uh, Eric is, is not good when you start uh, with the Pew Charitable Trust and their funding partner, which is the Open Society. And we all know what Open Society is. It's George Soros funded. Uh, sure, uh, that money, that seed money is most likely gone, but what that ERIC system does, it, every 60 days, uh, it dumps your personal information, the personal information of Alabamians into a private vendor that oversees our voter registration. That's your partial social security numbers, that's your driver's license numbers, that's your date of birth. I just had an 18-year-old daughter vote for the very first time back on May the 24th. She turned, uh, she turned 18 a week before that. And so that system takes those minors' information right before they turn 18 and turn it over to that private vendor, the ERIC system. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a very big problem with turning over minors' information to somebody, uh, a third party. And who's auditing that third party? There's only two or three uh, employees of ERIC. So they're outsourcing who's taking care of our voter registration information. And so on day one, I'll start the process of getting us out of there. We passed a bill uh, to allow us as a state to be able to use the national change of address with the United States Postal Service to help us better uh, manage our, uh, our voter rolls. And I will uh, work with the Board of Registrars like I have before as a probate judge to make sure they have the resources that they need and the training that they need to 
make sure and to manage our voter registration rules. All right, let me ask a, a quick follow-up to that because I, I'm not sure that I heard part of the question that I wanted to know the answer to. What will you use to maintain clean voter rolls that the Secretary of State's office is all not already using? I, I mentioned that. It was the National Change of Address, gotcha. that bill we passed uh, as, a, as a state legislature. Okay, but the Secretary of State's office uses that now. Is there anything else you would use? Uh, not off the top of my head, but uh, you know, listen, we're going to work very, very hard with the boards of registrars to make sure they have the resources available to them, and to make sure they have the training available, uh, to make sure. And, and we'll, you know, the uh, uh, Department of Public Health sends a, a vital statistic sends a list every month to those who have been deceased, and the circuit clerks and uh, AOC sends a list of those who've been put away and who are no, no longer eligible to vote because of breaking the law. So we're going to use every available tool in the toolbox to make sure our voter rolls are clean. Okay, thank you. Jim, question to you. Do you support the use of ERIC? If not, what would you use to maintain clean voter rolls that the Secretary of State is not already using? Do you support ERIC? There are two main concerns with ERIC. One is that when it was first established, a decade ago, there was initial funding from the Pew Trust, which in turn gets money from the Open Source Trust, which in turn gets money from George Soros. Now that is a red flag for you. That's a red flag for me. Since that time, it appears that Eric is fully funded or close to fully funded by dues coming from the 30 odd states that belong to it. As the Secretary of State, I would request full information on an audit of Eric's funding to ensure that no more tainted money has come into it since that that we know about when it first started. The second concern is that your data, every other Alabama's data, is going to an out-of-state operation over which we have little or no uh, accountability. The people of Alabama worry that their data is being given to some, some outfit that we can't control. Meanwhile, Eric does cleanse the voter rolls of dead names, people that have moved out of state and registered in other states, and people who have been convicted of a disqualifying crime. I will put together and look at the alternatives on how we can do those three things without Eric. The filing guidelines for campaigns in the state of Alabama, when you have to report what money you've raised, y'all are probably at the point now where you have to fill them out almost every day, right? Right. Maybe. Um, it is a cumbersome process, and it probably hasn't improved elections very much. Good people worry about doing something wrong. The bad guys don't care. They continue to do whatever it is that they do. Do you have recommendations to make the filing process for election easier, but still be able to maintain the transparency that was the goal of the legislation passed years ago. If every candidate would do like me and have very few donations, <laughs> therefore very little spending, it would be much easier and much more transparent. On the other hand, if the candidates did like Mr. Allen and had hundreds of thousands of dollars in campaign donations and therefore that much spending, uh, then it gets that much more complicated. Uh, I don't know. Fair enough. Fair enough. Wes? understand uh, that 
there's a lot of good people out there that don't want to trip up by just some rule that they just miss. And so what we want to do is just make sure that um, we abide by the law that was passed by the state legislature. But at the same time, we make resources available on the website um, that any, any person that wants to run for office will not be um, afraid to run because they're afraid they're going to, you know, slip up by no fault of their own. Like, you know, they don't want to mess up. People, good people want to do good things and they don't want to do it, you know, mess up. And so, listen, we, we want to give them the resources that, that they can navigate that website. But at the same time, we've got to make sure we abide by the law, a law that was passed. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to abide by the law and to uh, require uh, what's required as Secretary of State. And um, But we'll give the resources. And if, if somebody has any questions, we'll pick up the phone or call people back as Secretary of State or the staff will. And we'll help individuals navigate that, that information. So both of y'all think the process is great and there's no recommendation to make it better, smoother, easier, nothing. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> In 2025, just three years from now, the Secretary of State will, by law, take jurisdiction over municipal elections so that the candidates for mayor and city councilmen will for the first time have to file these same reports with the Secretary of State. And uh, I am going to have a transition period for these new thousands of candidates for the first time in this very technical system and uh, have seminars for the municipal candidates online and across the state uh, as, as we um, increase the size of the Secretary of State bureaucracy by about 25%. Now, that was done by the legislature, but I will have to administer that. Thank you, Jim. Wes, do you have any last words? All right. Thank you. All right. It, currently in Alabama, there is only one reason to disqualify someone from the ballot. And that reason is this. If a candidate fails to file their statement of economic interest within five days of the party's qualifying deadline, which is also the creation of their campaign committee. Um, so my question to you is, do you think that should be the only reason to deny ballot access? And this question goes to Wes first. someone should be denied ballot access. The ballot access issue goes to the parties. Great. You're leading me to my follow-up question. Well, go ahead so, and ask the follow-up okay. question. Let me see if what Jim has to say first. And, unless you have anything else. We'll come back to the follow-up question. You'll get to answer that. Okay. Okay, Jim. Is there another reason someone should be disqualified from ballot access? Denied ballot access? This is a tough one. Uh, no. Okay. I don't think that should be the only reason. Do you have? Do you know what the other reason? What another reason might be? Yes. Democrats running in a Republican primary. Hey. <laughs> okay. Good answer. Now I'm going to go to my follow-up question, though, because this is a real-life thing that has happened. We have 69 libertarians who qualified to be on the ballot in November for this year. But in Alabama, we don't have primaries for libertarians. We only have Democrat and Republican primaries. So those libertarians, there were 69 of them, all together they needed 55,000 signatures to gain ballot access. And they had more than enough. But after verification of those signatures, 12 candidates were disqualified for not filing their ethics form. Since they didn't have a party that they're registered with, they did not have to have the same qualifications. So we don't know how much money they collected, how many, how much in donations they spent. There's no transparency required for those candidates, but it's not against the law. As Secretary of State, would you support legislation to change that? Um, first off, they should follow it. If anybody runs, you know, like you're suggesting here. They need to file just like any 
member of the Republican Party candidate or Democratic Party candidate. As soon as they hit that thousand dollar threshold, they need to be filing with campaign finance rules and laws that we're under now. So that big number one is what I would suggest that we need to do and I would support legislation to make that happen. Okay, thank you. Jim, any comments? I never thought about that until just now. Uh, I will study that. Uh, I'm going to have, I'm going to start on Wednesday, the 22nd, if I'm blessed to be nominated, uh, a transition team. I, we do have a Democrat opponent and a Libertarian opponent in November. We'll run strong, but I'm going to start a transition team and we will study this issue in two dozen more and by January, when I would be blessed to become the Secretary of State, we'll have options for that and, and several other issues that I think deserve more than just my off the top of my head answer for something I never thought about. So to start out, I just want to make sure that everyone knows ambition in and of itself is not a bad thing. Both of you have run for and held other offices. Is the Secretary of State's office a stepping stone for the next higher office? Jim? At my age, no. <laughs> it might be a stepping stone to heaven. That's a higher <laughs> office. Wes? My philosophy on uh, the way I look at it, taught from a very early age. Um, I, I learned these principles on the football field and practice with, with Coach Stallings at the University of Alabama. And I was not the most talented guy on the team. Ray could tell you that. I mean, look at me, I'm 5'10", 165 pounds, you know, I, and I learned to run real fast, okay? <laughs> but you work while you wait, and you chop the wood in front of you, you know? I mean, that's my philosophy about Life. I mean, I tried to instill that in my kids. And um, so you work while you wait and you chop the wood in front of you. And as a probate judge, that's just what I did. I got in there and worked. And I got in there and worked as a state legislator. And there was an opportunity because this is an open seat because Mr. Merrill is term limited. Mr. Cook mentioned it earlier. We need good people in office, elected office. And that's why I'm offering myself for service. Okay, I've got a couple of one minute questions. I wanna sneak in here and then we'll go back to yours. Okay. What duty do you think the Secretary of State's office should be able to do that he can't do now? You, there may not be one, but that's a short one minute answer. Well, right now they've got like a thousand duties that they do. I mean, the Secretary of State's office is a vital office. It's important. We have, um, what happened in 2020, when we look around the country with the election and the chaos and confusion that happened, this office is important. There are a lot of people watching these offices nationwide and who you put in there, it, it matters who you have and who you have in that office. One thing I will touch on, uh, as a probate judge, as you know, every probate judge in every county is the caretaker of Bible documents. So when you go in, to your courthouse, you record your deeds and mortgages and all those important documents go to the probate judge. That's where economic development starts. And the same thing, those same principles with the Secretary of State. So those LLCs and corporations and all those business entities flow through the Secretary of State. That's where economic development starts. And you've gotta have somebody in there that knows the job and has experience dealing with that type of information. And that's me. All right, Jim, is there a duty that you think the Secretary of State should be able to do that he can't currently do now? The current administration has done an outstanding, successful job at voter registration. We now have the highest percentage of eligible voters registered in history and one of the highest percentages in the United States. I'm going to use that as a model and I will start a program for the real problem now. Right now, the problem is not voter registration. It's voter turnout on election day. And I have the draft already of a plan to better inform voters. People
people today told me they don't know there's an election a week from tomorrow. That's not just their fault. That's all our faults, including the media. I will have a program, and I call it, Don't Vote, Don't Complain. This will be a short one also. What is the most important job of the Secretary of State? 90 seconds. The business and corporations and the LLCs is important, and international adoptions, trademarks, uh, state records, notaries are all important. The administration of the state elections is clearly the most important, particularly in these times when we've had trouble nationally with the election process. Let me just say, um, it's not the job, in my opinion, of the Secretary of State to increase voter turnout. The job of the Secretary of State is to protect our elections, to make sure our elections process is secure and accurate and transparent, and to work with our probate judges and circuit clerks and sheriffs and board of registrars to make sure every vote is counted, every legal vote is counted. It's the job of the candidate to turn their people out and to create enthusiasm for why they want to go vote for somebody. The most important job of the Secretary of State, as we've seen over the last two years, is to protect our elections process. I'm the only candidate in this race that has the experience to do that. When you take office, what will be your first priority? Let me just say, everything under, under the umbrella of the Secretary of State's office is vitally important because it affects somebody. It affects somebody that has to interface with that office. So it's really, really important that we get it right. We get every function of that office correct, you know, right, and we do it right, and we respond to the customer, the taxpayer. I always told uh, the ladies in, uh, that, that worked uh, in the probate office when I was in, in, at the Pike County Probate Office and when I was a probate judge, every person that walks in that office is our customer into the courthouse. Now, they may not necessarily need our services in the probate office, but we'll get them pointed in the right direction. And so that's my philosophy. And so first day is gonna make sure we start the process, like I said earlier, getting this out of area. First priority, your, what is your most important priority when you become, sec if you become Secretary of State? Not only do our elections need to be accurate, fair, honest, but the public, the Alabama public needs to have confidence in the election process. Right now we have more questioning, more lack of confidence in the accuracy and fairness of our election counts than we've ever had in my lifetime and possibly ever. You can solve both of those problems, the actual fairness and honesty and the confidence level with a program that I'm starting to put together and will continue in our transition team starting on June 27th. That leads me to uh, this question. It's a little longer, and I apologize for the length of the question, but I want the audience at home and here to understand, and y'all as well. In what we all may call the real world, real world processes, um, when we do things, we confirm them or we check them for accuracy. For example, if a business has a machine that is supposed to put 100 nuts or bolts in a package, Someone stops that machine from time to time. Someone counts the boxes, pulls out a box, and says, are there 100 bolts in this box, right? Are there 100 marbles in this box? And that's what happens in what I call the real world. As far as I know, the state of Alabama has never done that for its election. 
So we keep being told how perfect our elections are. We're award winning, we're the best, we're the best of the best. How do we know that when we don't check to see if the right number of bolts are in the boxes or votes are in the boxes? And what would you do about it? We need to have audits of the elections uh, each time. There will be some costs to the taxpayers, but this is a constitutional republic in which we elect our government. And so uh, the elections is possibly the basis of our constitutional republic. Ben Franklin, leading the constitutional convention, told the lady who, when asked, what kind of government have you given us, Mr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. I've never in my life thought that we were in danger of losing this republic until now. I worry about it now, and as a Secretary of State, I'm going to rebuild and do exactly this. Trust, but verify. I was very proud to support the bill by former probate judge David Standridge, who now serves in the House with us. He uh, sponsored a bill, uh, 2021 legislative session, that allows for the state to conduct post-election audits in three counties. Uh, I believe those counties have already been chosen, uh, but it will be after the 22 general election. We'll see how that goes, and they've got to work uh, along with the county commission and with the probate judge in those counties to make sure we can get that done. So I'm very proud to have supported that bill. And if, and if that, and if that uh, law is successful, uh, I don't see any reason why we can't look at expanding that down the road. Uh, but we've got a law in place right now that it will be used at the 2022 general election. I was proud to support that bill to audit three counties in the state of Alabama. And if it goes well, we can certainly and I would want to look at expanding that role. Yes, sir. All right, can you tell us if Alabama has had actual cases of voter fraud? And so that's the first part. And then do you think additional legislation needs to be offered to make elections more transparent? If so, what? Yes, there's been voter fraud. I mean, we, we've seen the convictions. Uh, there were some down uh, Houston County, I think, with absentee election uh, ballot fraud. So we've seen it. Uh, so we know it goes on. Um, matter of fact, we need to increase the penalties for election fraud. Uh, and what was the second part of that? What What additional, or what would you do to make right. elections more right. transparent? Right. Um, I sponsored a bill in the legislature this past legislative session. Uh, to end the practice of ballot harvesting, especially as it pertains to absentee applications and absentee ballots. It's fine to help someone, your family member, your immediate family, that's no problem at all. Or it's fine to help someone out of the goodness of your heart. But you should not be paid and not be compensated going out and rounding up all these absentee election applications and absentee ballots. Um, Fortunately, we didn't get that bill passed across the finish line, so uh, that'll be a bill uh, when I'm elected as Secretary of State that I'll advocate for with my friends that I have relationships with in the House and Senate to get passed next year. Jim, question to you. Stricter enforcement of existing laws would help. There may be some additional legislation that is needed. For instance, if a person is convicted of election fraud, in addition to the enumerated penalty in the criminal code, they need to be barred from ever being involved in the election process for life. At any level, they need to, they need to be out. Right? That will have a preventive effect also we need to study the election laws. Some of the misdemeanors may need to be felonies. Some of the penalties may need to be uh, increased. Some things that are not 
a criminal violation now may need to be made a criminal violation. So one of the dozens of things that my transition team will take up on June 22nd will be uh, the election laws and the need for strengthening them. Okay, we are going to turn the corner. I'm gonna ask one more question before we have closing statements. I want you to tell us a story from this campaign season that was the most memorable campaign thing that has happened while you've been on the trail. This past week, as I campaigned across Alabama, and even today, as I campaigned in Chilton and Jefferson counties, I ran into people who do not know that there is a runoff. Many more who do not know when the date of the runoff is. Very few people realize it's one week from tomorrow. Very few people know the races that are on the ballot for the runoff, much less the candidates for those. I'm going to start a program, if I'm blessed to be your Secretary of State, to better inform the people of Alabama. It's not necessarily that person's fault that he doesn't know. This is where leadership comes in to inform the people, and I will provide that. So uh, it's been a, a long year. It's been a good year. I mentioned this earlier. Um, it's a tough question about, put this on the spot, about what's the one thing. But I would say, um, just being able to get to meet the individuals of this state that makes our state so great. You know, they're hardworking people, people of faith. Um, but I appreciate the encouragement when I've been out on the campaign trail over the last year, Ben King and Scott, of people just coming up and, and, and thanking me for uh, the things that I've been able to stand up for and to advocate for in the legislature. Um, those tough bills that we take tough votes on we take those arrows and when we advocate for conservative causes and in addition to fighting for election security uh, being in those individuals that speak encouraging words to us on the campaign trail because the campaign trail is long so i appreciate those individuals that and those voters and those friends that that um they just came up and spoke words of encouragement and it tells me too that you know we need to, to do that to other folks as well to speak or be encouragers and speak words of encouragement to people along the way. And so uh, that's what I appreciate about the campaign trail. So Wes, closing statements with you. All right, so I'm going first. I went first to kick the program off, right? Yeah, you went the same. Okay, good. You don't have to from back, yeah. so I think the closing statements will be pretty good. So. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, I'm very proud to be here tonight at Eagle Forum. I have been a partner with Eagle Forum for the last four years. Got this mail out in the mail. My name was on it twice because of good bills that passed. The first was VCAP to protect these minors from puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And, uh, those, we sponsored that bill for three straight years. We got it across the finish line this year because it was the right thing to do to protect our kids. Passed the Zuckerberg bill to ban the prohibit the private money of purchasing election equipment or purchasing ballots. So I've been a partner with, with Eagle Forum and thank you for what you fight for. We've got a very big decision to make in about a week. Listen, you're electing me. You're not gonna be electing some transition team or some unelected bureaucrats. You're electing me to lead in the Secretary of State's office. There's only one person in this race that has the experience as a former probate judge who's ran elections. There's only one person in this race that's actually stood in the well of that house taking the tough votes to protect elections. There's nobody else in this race that's done it. I've done it. I'm ready day one. We don't need somebody to sit around and watch. We need someone who's gonna take action to protect our elections on day one. I'll be ready on day one when I step into that office. And I'm asking for your vote on June the 21st.
Regardless of which one of us is a Republican nominee on June 21st, I endorse the Republican nominee for Secretary of State. I will support our nominee in November. We have a Democrat opponent who's a substantial candidate uh, and a Libertarian opponent who I, I do not know yet. The Democrats have a strategy. They think the Libertarian can take 10 to 15 percent off of the Republican nominee and make the Democrat candidate competitive. I will fight against that. The, la the next to the last time that the Democrats won a statewide race, it was Secretary of State. And we had a bad experience under the last Democrat Secretary of State. We do not need that with the 2024 presidential elections coming up. Now, having said that, I am electorally qualified in terms of the election process with the three times the Republican Party sent me to Florida for weeks to fight against election problems. With my education, a degree in public administration, that's exactly what this is, a degree, a Jewish doctorate with coursework in constitutional law and election law. So the idea that the, he's the only person in the room qualified is simply untrue. Now, you've got one candidate backed by the Montgomery establishment, one candidate who fights against the Montgomery establishment, one candidate that voted for the gas tax 10 cents a gallon, one that led the citizen movement against the gas tax. You have a clear, clear choice of two qualified candidates, an establishment and a taxpayer candidate. And we are going to take responses. With one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, I contend that I am the only person in this race with the experience as a former probate judge who has the relationships with the probate judges around the state because I was the president of the Alabama Probate Judges Association during my time. I've worked with circuit clerks all over this state during the, my time in the state legislature. I know elections from start to end. There's only one person in this race that's gonna be prepared on day one with the experience, the passion, and the energy to do the job. There will not need to be any on-the-job training comes to electing Wes Allen as the next Republican Secretary of State. Gentlemen, thank you for taking part. I would love to thank especially 1819 News, Ray Mellick for being here with us, Scott Beeson Radio for Priority Talk with Greg Dr Davis for opening us up, and all of those watching on Facebook, thank you for joining us tonight. If you appreciate what you've seen, we would love to have you become a member of Eagle Forum. You can go to alabamaeagle.org or you can take a picture of the QR code, throw us a donation, that would be so helpful.